recreate cup chat chat chanam nei tumnia tom non gatut rowing brote kampuchia nang brote australia very good mornings ladies and gentlemen today i'm very happy to be uh, joined by ambassador pablo gang uh, australian ambassador to cambodia ambassador very good morning, good morning. thank you so much for joining morning, me today uh, i believe that last time we met and we had discussed much issue related to Cambodian and Australia bilateral relation, but in broader term. But mm -hmm. this year is very remarkable as our tie reached 70 years already. So it has been so long that we have been friends, have been partner and so on, and your country have been contribu contributed a lot to our uh, country development. Just to name few from education to government reform to rural development, so social security and so on. So uh, I would like to learn from you more about the over past 70 years. For example, like uh, current relations. So uh, to begin with, I would like to ask you a very simple question. Uh, what is your assessment of the current bilateral relation between the two countries over the past 70 years? Okay, well thank you and, and thanks to everyone who's watching. Uh, you're right, 70 years is a big achievement. Uh, there's not that many countries that have had diplomatic relations with Cambodia for 70 years and of course that means that uh, when we established relations back in January 1952, Cambodia was still part of the French Union back then, had not fully attained independence that was to follow the next year. Uh, and uh, as Prime Minister Hun Sen commented recently, uh, the recognition of the decision of countries such as Australia and a few others to establish diplomatic relations uh, before independence was, a, was a, a great catalyst to Cambodia eventually gaining independence from France in 1953. Yes. Now the relations I think over 70 years, you know, we talk about it's been 70 years of diplomatic relations which basically means we uh, agreed to exchange diplomatic representatives between Cambodia and Australia, very much a government to government uh, decision. Um, but I would say the relationship has largely been driven by the people-to-people -people links. Um, so if you think about, for example, the fact that uh, so many Cambodians have studied in Australia, starting right back in the early 1950s, just after we established diplomatic relations, uh, the first Cambodian students went to Australia under a program that was called the Colombo Plan back then, and that was set up to um, bring students from across the Asia-Pacific region to Australia in the aftermath of the Second World War um, to, you know, to gain knowledge, to exchange information and cultural understanding and to obviously uh, get a good educational qualification. Um, since 1994, uh, we've had nearly 22,000 Cambodians study in Australia. Um, that's quite a remarkable uh, number and I meet them every day almost. Uh, in fact you're about to join quite, a, quite an uh, exclusive list of, but a growing list. So many Cambodians have studied in Australia. We've provided nearly 1,000 scholarships since 1994 um, for Cambodian students to study at masters and PhD level in Australia. So there is a, a, a really good cohort if you like of Cambodians who not only have studied in Australia but of course have lived in Australia. In many cases have taken their families with them uh, their children have gone to school in Australia, their partners have worked. Um, so that really helps to um, improve the understanding between the two countries. Now not just that of course, but many Cambodians have actually uh, moved to Australia permanently. Uh, they've gone to Australia as migrants, sometimes as refugees, you know, during the Khmer Rouge period and the aftermath in the 1980s. Uh, and they've settled in Australia. Others have, have um, just gone to Australia uh, as, a, as an economic decision, if you like. So um, if you look at uh, the number of Australians who have Cambodian background, it's about 66,000, which is quite a significant number for um, you know, a population of 16 million and Australia's population about 25 million. Yeah, you know, the town of Kampong Tom is about 66,000 people. <laughs> so if you look at it that way, it's about everyone who lives in Kampong Tom. That, that's the sort of number of Australians who have Cambodian background. And they, they make a very important contribution to Australia's uh, very culturally diverse yeah. uh, society. 
uh, and still retain a very active interest, of course, in Cambodia. And in fact, I know a lot of Cambodians who um, have, having gone to Australia when they were very young, uh, sometimes as refugees with their parents, have now come back to Cambodia uh, to do business and, and to do very successfully. Uh, so the bedrock of the 70 years of diplomatic relations, uh, I think, is in the people-to-people -people links. Of course, Australia has uh, helped Cambodia and Cambodia has helped Australia at that time, during that time at the government-to-government -government level. Um, we've had a number of development assistance programs, which I can talk about more later, um, government-to-government -government contacts and so on, a big role that Australia played in the Paris Peace Agreements in uh, the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia that um, followed that and we're celebrating actually 30 years of that this year as well. Yeah. Thank you Ambassador, it has been a very fruitful year and you give us a very comprehensive assessment of the relationship. But as Ambassador yourself, can you tell us what are the biggest achievements or the achievements that you're most proud of? when it comes to these bilateral relations reaching 70 years? <clears throat> yes, uh, well I think um, uh, the fact that uh, Australia um, in, the, in the course of the 70 years played a very important role in uh, helping bring peace to Cambodia. Um, if, if you ask a lot of Australians about Cambodia, um, of course they'll say, oh Angkor Wat, you know, beautiful temples. Um, then they'll think about the Khmer Rouge, yep. right? Uh, and for Australians who know Cambodia more than that, they'll think about Australia's role mm -hmm. in uh, first helping to broker the Paris Peace Agreements, which were signed in October 1991. I think without, without those agreements, we wouldn't have been able to bring the, the different uh, warring factions to the table uh, with the promise of the United Nations playing a transitional governing role for Cambodia. Um, that was a, a, a big diplomatic initiative by a number of countries, not just Australia of course, you know, France, Indonesia, Japan, they all played a big role. Um, but certainly at the time, um, I think Australia was very influential and, and is still regarded as such, even if you ask the, the senior leadership of the Cambodian government today, they have very clear memories and yeah. recollections of Australia's role. Then of course the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia that followed that um, General John Sanderson, who led the military component of UNTAC, um, and uh, around 1,200 other Australians who played uh, roles in UNTAC, uh, whether it be military, police, civilian roles. Um, that was a huge contribution from us. So if I was to pick one thing, or maybe two things, <laughs> it would be the Paris Peace Agreements and UNTAC, because that's what Australia is probably most well known for in the history of Cambodia. But what about the current or the latest contribution? Can you name sure. ones of it? Can I name one thing? Hmm. Very difficult to <laughs> name one thing. Uh, currently, um, if I had to name one thing, I would say, well, of course, COVID Doprambun is in Cambodia as it is everywhere. And we made a very conscious decision at the beginning of the pandemic to, to help Cambodia, yeah. to help Cambodia manage uh, its response to COVID. Yeah. Of course, a big part of that response has been uh, vaccines and vaccinations. Uh, and so I think the fact that Australia was able to, through our own grant funding, uh, provide 2.35 million doses of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to Cambodia in December last year, uh, that is now being rolled out uh, in, in Phnom Penh, first of all, as uh, fourth doses. So anyone yeah. who's had a fourth dose has probably had it through Pfizer and that's through Australia. Yep. Um, but then also we're now helping to uh, bring those vaccines to the provinces. We recently took delivery of 33 ultra cold freezers which are now being uh, sent to the provinces and they will allow the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to be stored mm. uh, for longer periods. You know, and I'm talking about minus 80 degrees, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so that, that means that people in the provinces won't have to come to Phnom Penh to get their vaccines. They can now get them in where they are. Uh, and also it means that future uh, donations of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine will also be able to be delivered immediately to the provinces. So we, we've partnered with uh, UNICEF uh, also on public awareness and education campaigns in relation to social distancing, 
personal hygiene, the benefits of getting vaccinations. We've helped train uh, health force workers as well and provided some of that um, cold chain uh, yeah. supply equipment and personal protective equipment. So we've, we've done, uh, I think we've done a pretty big job uh, in, in the context of Cambodia's um, vaccination rollout and broader response to COVID. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me move to one of the most important issues, education. So in education in particular, I, I, I believe that Australia has been doing a lot, just like many other uh, partners, <coughs> but uh, in terms of providing education opportunity to women, to disab uh, disabled people, to also uh, many young scholars in Cambodia, from mm -hmm. even the provinces, many of them traveling to Australia to pursue the education. Because you believe that uh, this is going to be uh, the future leader, the, the leader who uh, assists the development of the country. But over the past 70 years, well, you talk about Colombo plan and then uh, there's an Australian Award Scholarship. So are you optimistic about what you're doing with the firm and generous support in terms of education? Yeah, I'm very optimistic. Um, the next generation of Cambodians, um, it's going to be up to them to keep, keep taking the country forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, the older generation or the generation that was, was there around the time of the Khmer Rouge and immediate aftermath, um, you know, they're getting quite old now. Um, but, you know, I meet so many Cambodians who have studied in Australia and who've come back and are doing very well, whether that be in the government, in the private sector, in civil society, as you say, from the provinces, from Phnom Penh, uh, many women, like I think over 50% of our current scholarship intake are women, which is something that we've been uh, putting a lot of emphasis on, people with disabilities. Um, and they all say the same thing. They all say that their time in Australia was a life-changing experience for them. Um, not just for the study, but just being exposed to a different society, a different culture, maybe a different way of thinking, yeah. uh, a, a particular set of, uh, of values. Um, lifestyle, um, just a different way of thinking um, f to what they're used to, right? And I think uh, that kind of exposure to different views, different opinions, different techniques, different people uh, is, is, of, uh, is of great benefit. And, and I see the younger generation who have come back and are doing so well in Cambodia today, and I think that's a very good, very good sign for the future. Thank you, Ambassador. So uh, 70 years, maybe it has been long when it comes to counting the number, but how do you see the bilateral relation between the two in the next 70 years? In the next 70 years. And of course, at the same <coughs> time, the time I reach different level, Cambodia also reached dif uh, different steps of development. Mm. What should be the priority mm. in terms of support sure. that your country is going to offer to the country? Yeah, I think it'll be a different relationship. You know, the first 70 years, of course, Cambodia uh, has been developing. Uh, and obviously in the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge, really starting from scratch in many ways. Um, so a developing country, a developing economy. Uh, Australia's placed a lot of priority on assisting, especially countries in our region. We very much think of ourselves as part of the, the Indo-Pacific region, so we're neighbours with Cambodia. It's, we're not that far away, we're in a very similar time zone. We have all those people-to-people -people links already. Um, so we put a lot of priority on it and helping countries like Cambodia, because if you help countries in the region, then you're helping the stability and prosperity of the region, and we're part of the region. So it's in our interests uh, as well. But, you know, the next 70 years will be different because Cambodia has been growing and growing, and um, notwithstanding COVID, which has obviously mm -hmm. been a bit of a bump in that growth trajectory. But before COVID, you know, Cambodia was averaging 6-7% growth every year. There is still the intention to try and hit um, higher middle income status or upper middle income status as a country by 2030 and higher income status by 2050. So if that happens, uh, the relationship will change because there won't be so much emphasis on development assistance but more on trade and investment, yeah. uh, ongoing people-to-people -people links. Um, Cambodia won't require the kind of assistance that it, that it needs now from international partners, from its own government budget, etc. So I think, you know, we've been looking at our development assistance program of actually starting that journey, that transition, moving away from uh, funding projects where we, we build things ourselves, 
um, in, in villages, small scale projects, and more working with the systems, working with the government budget, working with other uh, partners, the private sector, to help encourage that kind of growth. Because that's what Cambodia will need in the future. So the next 70 years, Cambodia will be a much more developed economy, I think. And as such, you know, the relationship with Australia uh, will be more like uh, the relationship we have now with other developed economies where we don't have a bilateral aid program, right? We have uh, trade investment, trade agreements. We have um, uh, a lot of sort of, if you're looking into the future, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 which uh, Cambodia is very keen to embrace, uh, as is Australia, a lot more sort of high-tech focus, uh, a lot more focus, for example, on um, uh, renewable energies, lower emission energy technologies, all those kinds of things that basically um, we're starting to look at now. But uh, up until this point, a big focus has been on assisting with agriculture, assisting with basic infrastructure, assisting with basic healthcare. Um, the scholarships. Uh, a lot of countries um, around the world where we have uh, relations with, we don't provide scholarships to because they're developed economies. So at some point, you know, if we get to the point where we won't provide scholarships to Cambodia, uh, you'll have to think of that as a good thing uh, because that means that Cambodia has become an advanced economy. Uh, a lot of Cambodians, of course, um, also uh, fund themselves to study in Australia, right? We've had 22,000 Cambodians since 1994. The majority of those have been self-funded, uh, only about 950 scholarships in that period. Um, but over time, that will become 100%. I see. Thank you, Ambassador. So it's not just about uh, your support in terms of uh, education and then the, uh, development assistance and social economics uh, development as well, but because of the, the uh, when we look at the, the, uh, the global perspective from, from, from our views, and then we see there's a lot of issues facing the world right now, including backtrackings of liberal democracy and so on. And many, many countries in the region have faced that. And uh, by mentioning this, Cambodia itself is going to hold election in, uh, in June for a communal election and next year election for the national ones. So as friend and partner, uh, can you share with us what your country has been doing to ensure that the country will be moving forward and successfully hosting this mm. election with free and fair and in a democratic way? Thank you, guys. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. And, uh, you know, if you look at Cambodia's constitution, which was developed during that UNTAC period, Article 1 talks about Cambodia, the Kingdom of Cambodia, as being based on the principles of liberal multi-party yeah, democracy. democracy. Right? So these are very fine words. Uh, of course, the challenge is uh, to ensure that they are the reality. Uh, and that is an ongoing challenge for Cambodia, definitely. Um, and I think a challenge that maybe other countries in the region don't face as much. Yeah. Because other countries in the region, including Cambodia's immediate neighbors, have different systems of government, uh, maybe only have one party, uh, do not have a civil society to speak of. Yeah. Right, but they don't have a constitution that says that they're a liberal <laughs> multi-party <laughs> democracy. Uh, so that's Cambodia's uh, yep. uh, burden to bear, if you like, yep. and a, a aspiration to live up to, right, if I put yep. it in a positive yep. way. Right. So I think there'll be a lot of focus on the commune elections firstly this June and then next year's national elections, of course, especially yep. what happened in uh, 20, uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, people still remember that. Yeah. Now we... Um, we uh, do what we can, uh, along with other countries that are also concerned about, about these issues, to encourage, firstly, the government to hold elections, as you say, that are free and fair, that there is proper contestability, that, that people uh, from all different political persuasions can, uh, firstly, run as candidates, uh, run free from harassment or intimidation, like run fairly, register in the, in the, in the usual way, and that people are free to support um, who, they, who they want. And, and you know, if you look at the, the top levels of government here, the Prime Minister or well, Deputy Prime Minister Sa Keng, um, they've said a few things recently which we would encourage. Right? Yeah. And it's, for example, um, the registration process at the commune level should be unimpeded and yeah. um, 
other political parties that are not the CPP should be allowed to put up their you know, Sorry. banners and yeah. signs yeah. and have their candidates talk freely and so on. Um, now, the message that we're receiving on the ground, however, is a little bit different. And I think, so that top level message may not be getting down to the, to, to the ground level in yeah. all cases. So that's something that we need to continue to encourage the government to work on. But it's not just about words. So for us, we're looking at uh, different projects where we actually support um, uh, civil society yeah. and independent media to monitor the lead up to the elections and the, the holding of the elections and so that they can uh, come to their own views uh, about whether the elections were free and fair and based on the democratic principles that are so enshrined yeah. in Cambodia's constitution. Um, so, you know, it is a work in progress, but there will be a lot of interest and a lot of attention on it. And uh, certainly from Australia's perspective, a lot of interest and attention. Part of the reason why there is that interest and attention is what I was saying before, there are 66,000 Australians of Cambodian descent. Yep. And uh, they all take a, a very keen interest in what's going on in Cambodia, uh, a, as you would the country of your, your ancestry, or in some cases, the country of your birth. Uh, and of course, other Australians who like worked in Cambodia, UNTAC, for example, um, also you know take a keen interest in in the development of Cambodia because of course, you know UNTAC was again led to the constitution which has those principles uh, in it. Yeah. Uh, and so um, you know um, it's certainly in our interests overall to to keep to keep uh, the focus on Cambodia's democratic journey. Um, but we have a personal interest as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. If you don't mind, let me move a little bit back to the 70 year anniversary. Mm -hmm. I just want to get your frank advice to our youth. There's a lot of youth activity. There's a growing number of youth-led program in almost every aspect of society from uh, entrepreneur, from entrepreneurship to uh, environment, to social development, to education and so on. As ambassador, friends and partner, what your advice to them and what your views on this kind of trends that Cambodia has been seeing over the past maybe I think few years. Well, it's a great trend. Uh, of course Cambodia is a very young country. Uh, unlike Australia, um, you know, two-thirds of your population is under 30. That means that two-thirds of Cambodians were not, were not born uh, during the UNTAC period, right? Because that's 30 years. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, because Cambodia is a young society, it has been a rapidly growing society, uh, I mean, in terms of the economy. Um, things like Industrial Revolution 4.0, the uptake of e-commerce, in particular during COVID, how that's kind of by necessity spread even further. I think Cambodia was already um, very well practiced <laughs> at e-commerce. I mean, I use things like Nyam Mapai Bun, Grab, you know, ABA Pay. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to promote a certain <laughs> bank, but I use those uh, apps every day, right? Yeah, and they're yeah. so great. Um, but during, uh, during COVID, I think uh, it's gone to another level. Yeah. Uh, and you talked about entrepreneurs. You know, I've met a lot of young, particularly young women entrepreneurs, and yeah. we know that women uh, own the majority of micro and small, medium yeah. enterprises in Cambodia. They're very entrepreneurial and they use the internet, they use those online applications to further their business. Um, education we talked about, uh, but I think you know, that the trends that Cambodia's going, going down, the, the, the path to uh, an emphasis on science and technology, the, the STEM subjects, um, I think that's, that's very important for Cambodia. Um, Cambodia's had a great record over the years in access to education but now the challenge is to get to the next level, which is to improve the quality of education. Not, so not just having kids turn up to school, but actually having teachers yeah. who are well-trained and can provide a good education. So these are all challenges, but it's, a, it's an exciting time, I think, to be in Cambodia. If you're a young person <laughs> under 30, which like two thirds of, <laughs> two -thirds of you are, um, hopefully, hopefully, and I'll touch wood when I say this, moving out of the pandemic, or moving more to an endemic type situation, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel's been very long, of <laughs> course. We're not out of it yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, for young people, I think there's uh, a lot of good reasons to be optimistic. 
Thank you, Ambassador, for your overview and also advice to young people as well. Mm. So let me move to current uh, Cambodia chairmanship. I mean, as a ASEAN, sorry, yes. uh, Cam uh, current uh, ASEAN chairmanship. Cambodia is holding. So it's in, I think it's three months right now since the early uh, 2022. So there's a lot of challenge. Cambodia has been trying to deal with as the as the head of mm. or leading the organization. Mm. So. Uh, from your side, uh, what has uh, Australia been doing to support Cambodia to ensure that its chairmanship will be able to mm. help or lead the region to get out of this? Yeah, well, it's a great question. I think uh, like Australia has a very long-standing relationship with ASEAN. So ASEAN, of course, there's 10 members of ASEAN and there's 11 dialogue partners. What we call they're not members, but they're very close partners of ASEAN. And Australia is the oldest, so Australia became a dialogue partner of ASEAN back in 1974, right? Yeah. And then last year, uh, ASEAN decided that it would elevate uh, its relationship with Australia to what we call a comprehensive strategic partnership. There's only two countries that ASEAN has a comprehensive strategic partnership with, and they both yeah. decided last year: Australia yeah. and China. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a real recognition of that uh, long-standing relationship that we've had, the cooperation, the economic, technical, development cooperation we've had with ASEAN in that time. Uh, and so uh, it's a perfect time, in a way, for Cambodia to be taking on the chair of ASEAN as we are now a comprehensive strategic partner. Yeah. Uh, and I think, of course, it's not an easy time um, with, as you say, with Myanmar, uh, that's that's uh, I guess was an unforeseen issue uh, until the coup happened yeah. uh, a bit over a year ago. Ukraine again, <laughs> uh, another yeah. um, issue that's come up very quickly, a crisis that ASEAN has also had to consider, and then the broader uh, challenges of, uh, as you say, managing a recovery uh, from COVID, yeah. economically, tourism, uh, people to people health of course, health yeah. security, um, how, does, how does that happen? We've put a lot of focus into supporting uh, Cambodia and talking very actively with Cambodia in its chair role. So our Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, she visited Cambodia yeah. in November last year, just as actually Cambodia had formally uh, taken over the chairing responsibility, even though it didn't, it didn't actually start until the beginning yeah. of this year, but um, they took it over from Brunei in October last year. Yeah. Uh, she visited in November, we had a lot of very good discussions on how we could support Cambodia in its in its chairing role. Our ambassador to ASEAN, who's based in Jakarta, visited in January this yeah. year. And then only a few weeks ago, our senior ASEAN official, uh, Katrina Cooper, visited from Canberra. So we've put a lot of focus into actually talking to Cambodia about yeah. these issues, about COVID recovery, about Myanmar, Ukraine most recently. Um, what uh, A few practical things that we've done. Firstly, Cambodia has got a lot of, uh, putting a lot of emphasis in its chair year to um, women's economic empowerment uh, and advancing their cause of gender equality. And Cambodia is quite progressive, I think, when it comes to these issues. Yeah. So Cambodia will host um, ASEAN Women Leaders Summit this year as part of its chairing role, and we are actively supporting that, both from a policy sense and a financial sense. So that's something that we're already doing. Also, it's a big year for ASEAN on the, on the trade agenda. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, yeah. RCEP, the big FTA, has just come into force. It's entered yeah. into force now from the beginning of this year. Australia is a member. Yeah. Cambodia is a member. Uh, also, we have our own free trade agreement with Cambodia it's, uh, and, and ASEAN. It's the ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. And we're looking to upgrade that um, by September this year to make it a more modern, um, more um, e-commerce focused uh, free trade agreement. Um, so to, to help Cambodia with all these things, we've actually, um, if you like, donated one of our offices from our foreign ministry, uh, which is also our trade ministry, so yeah. it's our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to actually work in the Ministry of Commerce this year. So he's actually working there for 12 months to help Cambodia on the ASEAN economic agenda side. There's other things that we're looking uh, to do this year with Cambodia uh, in its ASEAN chair year, especially around Myanmar. We're very supportive of uh, ASEAN's leadership on Myanmar and yeah. Cambodia's efforts as the chair. We know the Foreign Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Prat Sakon is visiting Myanmar next week. 
as the ASEAN Special Envoy. We've had a number of discussions about that, uh, about um, about you know how we think Cambodia could could try and uh, progress a very difficult uh, relationship between Myanmar and not just ASEAN but the international community and with a very very serious situation on the ground. Um, COVID recovery, of course, will be a, a big theme, and I think trade and investment, that, that side of the ASEAN agenda is going to really going to help. Uh, uh, there'll be a very good focus on RCEP, I think, this year that you'll see. Um, but also things like encouraging women uh, and yeah. economically empowering them, uh, because women will have a critical role to play in the economic recovery, given that within ASEAN, so many of the small businesses that we've discussed are, are owned managed and run by women. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for your comprehensive assessment of the Thai as well as your perspective on the current Cambodian chairman of okay. ASEAN. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.